Sacred Blinding by Matty G. One, two, three. Narrated by Ira Tate. Part one. I was maimed in the Great Blinding, just like everybody else. One day the world was a colorful pastel full of life and movement, and the next day we were blind. Not just some of us. Everybody was blind. Color became something that was instead of something that is. I could pick up an apple and not know if it was red or green or yellow, or maybe it was just something made to feel like an apple. For a time, I would talk about the delicate red feathers of a cardinal. I could hear chirping outside my bedroom window. Soon it was just a cardinal, and finally it was just a bird. We lost color, and with the color left a little part of us. I felt the life trickle out of me the longer I was enveloped in darkness. Walks at the park were monotonous now. Meaningless as the darkness, there was as dark as the darkness anywhere else. I could feel the leaves, the little veins that coursed up from the stem and the ridges and the edges of the bark of a tree. I could hear the splash of water when I tossed a rock into the pond, but I could no longer see the ripples of the water or the ducks scurrying away. I knew there should be a meaning to all this. Some entity encouraging me to learn to utilize my other senses, or to appreciate the sounds of the world. But all I could think of was how beautiful it all used to be. It's been two years since the blinding. Two years of darkness. Two years of indoctrination. Verbal illumination, as they called it. We were told what we would see if we could see. We were told how it should look, and what it should mean, and why things were never quite the way we thought they were. It has been two years since the blinding, and it has been two hours since I opened my eyes and things were different again. My world was no longer black when I awoke. Suddenly, a long, unfamiliar contrast between my eyes being open and my eyes being closed. It was off-putting, but relieving. Terrifying, but intriguing. There was color again. Not the beautiful oranges and reds and greens of autumn leaves, but at least there was more than just darkness. The walls were gray and the world was foggy. Shapes turned to letters as I read the words scrawled on my bedroom walls. Don't tell them you can see, I deciphered, barely construing the different shades of gray that outlined the words, so I didn't. The paranoia overtook me as I hid my vision from whatever power had rendered me blind. I did my best to play it off, to not look at the little gray birds perched on my windowsill, and to hide my excitement from my colleagues. I went about my day as I would a blind man, using my hands like feelers as I groped and grasped my way about. I tapped away at the keyboard on my desk, the lifeless machine reciting back to me my keystrokes and any information it considered relevant to my role. The firm had adopted seamlessly to the blinding, installing backup measures as if they had been preparing them for years. I peeked. It was the same monotony it had always been. In the bathroom, I saw the words again. Etched into the mirror, they hadn't bothered to remove. Why would they, after all? We were all blind and mired in the misery of endless introspection. Mirror or no mirror, it made no difference. Everything was gray. The colors no more diverse than light gray and gray and dark gray. But there were those words again. Don't tell them you can see. I just stood there, looking at myself. My clothes were gray, and my face was gray, and my eyes, that had once been the faintest shade of blue, were gray and lifeless as the darkness we were supposed to be in. I shook my head. I fought back the sadness. I had assumed until now that color still was, if the darkness ever ended. The birds I heard would still be yellow and blue and red, and the plants would still have green leaves and purple flowers. Instead, they were all gray. I told myself that it was my vision, not that somebody had removed the colors themselves from our beautiful world. I found comfort in convincing myself that my vision was still impaired. The alternative was far worse. Outside the office, the street was gray, and the sky was gray, and the buildings that stretched towards that gray sky blended into the clouds, just a slightly different shade of gray. But as I looked out, a flash of color caught my eye. A man stood in the shadows of a building, looking out at me from the alleyway, as gray as everything else. His shirt was red, and his pants were blue, and even from a distance I could see the pink of his skin. It dawned on me that if he had color, then the birds really were gray and my curiosity struggled to overcome the overwhelming sadness I felt. I stared, and when I finally met his eyes, he waved me towards him and disappeared into the alley. <laughs>
Part 2. I patiently waited for the signal to indicate that it was safe to cross the street. Autonomous cars whizzed by, sightless people sitting idly. The alley was empty, and for a moment, I thought I had imagined the colored man. I didn't quite trust my vision, much less the dash of color in the gray world. But halfway into the alley, a door sat propped open, and a face quietly stared at me from the darkness. I glanced behind me, surreptitiously, as I approached, and I pulled the door shut behind me. For a fleeting moment, I panicked as I was pitched into darkness once again. Then a light flicked on, and I found myself in a gray room, leading to a similarly gray staircase. Don't tell them you can see. I read on the wall once again. I shuddered. The man was about my age, but his eyes were more youthful and alive than mine had been in the mirror that morning. They had color. He held out a hand that I rudely ignored. Welcome, he said with a coy smile, shrugging and putting his hand in his pocket. I didn't smile back. I had more questions than seemed appropriate to ask right then. Part of me felt like he was my savior, but part of me felt I was being dragged into something more sinister and illicit than I felt comfortable with. There wasn't much other reason to lead somebody into an alley and down a staircase. Come on, he said with a nod of his head. He turned to lead me down the stairs, but I hesitated. Who are you? I demanded. How are you colored? How did you find me? Who is them? I stayed where I was, tensed as if to make a break for the doorway, if his answers were not to my satisfaction. The words all referred to them, but what if being sighted was saving me from them? What if my best approach was to keep pretending I couldn't see, and go about my days as I had for the past two years? He chuckled as he turned back towards me. I'm Adam, he answered with a smile. I can answer some of your questions where it's safer. Others, I don't know the answer to. How did you find me? The other answers could wait. This one could not. He tilted his head at me curiously. I didn't, he responded mysteriously. You found me. I shook my head at him. That was absurd. The words were on my wall. He was waiting across the alley. He was looking right at me. Whatever this is, he said with a wave of his hand. This great blinding, it's loosening its grip. We're finding more and more people like you and me. Some can see again. Some can even see color. Some can even be colored. He was raising more questions with each sentence, and barely getting around to answering any of the ones I had asked. You got lucky, he said finally, by way of answer. If you hadn't seen me, you would still be wandering around not knowing what the hell was going on. I'm a watcher. My job is to find people who can see. He paused for a moment, as if lamenting the countless people who might have had sight again, but were just going about their lives pretending they were blind. Or perhaps they had let them find out, and that's why they couldn't be found. Downstairs, we have a colorer. He might be able to give you color, too. That was all I had to hear. I nodded, and I followed him down the stairs, and through another doorway. I was greeted by a normal-looking room. Not normal like the gray office I had been in earlier that day, but like the way things used to be. The walls were painted green, and red, and rainbow. There was a table with a stack of beautiful pictures. People bustled around in conversation, most of them fully colored. Adam sat me at the table, and told me he would be back in a moment. I thumbed through the pictures, admiring the landscapes and the brilliant colors. Would you like a drink with those? A voice asked. I glanced up to a grandfatherly old man. They're to help recruits relax, he explained, gesturing to the photographs. They were relaxing. I had missed the ocean and the mountains and the trees even more than I thought. Do you have juice? Orange juice? I asked, hopefully. He laughed boisterously. We do, he said when he was done laughing. You aren't the first person to ask for it. It's still orange, you know. It was, and I couldn't help but marvel at the liquid in the glass that was brought to me. I see you've met Charles, Adam said when he returned. He's our resident colorer. In case you're refusing to shake his hand, too, I suggest you shake it. We might be pleasantly surprised. I felt the blood rush to my cheeks, and by way of apology, I stood and shook Adam's hand first. I mumbled an apology, and he laughed it off. True, I said, introducing myself. I was a bit overwhelmed. And suspicious. I still am, to be honest. Charles extended a hand, which I eagerly took. Call me Chuck, he said with a grin. I looked down in awe as the color started to seep into my arm. The hue I hadn't seen in two years returning to my gray skin. I was left speechless for a moment, and then for another moment when Adam turned me towards a mirror, and I could see the color of my skin and hair in full. What happened out there? I stammered finally. The world was gray and lifeless from top to bottom. The trees and the people and the clouds and everything in between. Yet here, they had found the secret to color. The secret they seemed to be selfishly holding instead of spreading it back into the world again. For the first time, Adam's smile faltered and he directed me back to the table. He wrung his hands for a moment, as if agonizing over the right words to use. 
We don't know. The only difference between you and us is that you don't know what you don't know. We've been working to get answers, but... His sentence tapered off, and I took it to mean that there were more unknowns than knowns at this point. We call ourselves the Resistance, he chuckled at the wordplay. We don't know what or who we're resisting, but we figure it's something. I looked around. There were dozens of people going in and out of what seemed to be a network of rooms. I caught a glance at the next room over, which was painted in the same bright colors. People sat at computers, furiously working away. What are they doing? Communications had to be tracked. They were tracked before the Great Blinding, and there was no reason to think they wouldn't be tracked now. Even if they were using secure connections, somebody had to be seeing the work they were doing. Adam seemed glad to hear a question he could provide an answer to. They're trying to find answers. It seems like, at some level, somebody has to have answers. Everything was too ready for the blinding. There was barely a hiccup there, he said, pointing up towards the surface. Except for people like you and me, I had gotten the same vibe at the firm. There had been disaster recovery procedures in place for a disaster that nobody should have ever foreseen. Everybody seemed to have gone dark for a year, but then people started to see again. We don't know where it started, but we all eventually bumped into each other and started recruiting. Now we each have a role. What will mine be? I asked curiously. I clearly couldn't color, since I probably would have been able to color myself. This cell of the resistance movement seemed to already have enough watchers to fill the ranks. We'll work to figure that out. He stood abruptly and led me through another door into a gray bedroom. I saw the writing on the walls again, and I felt my heart start pounding. A young boy sat at a desk near a bed, dully listening to a book, his sightless eyes staring blankly at a wall. His skin was a familiar gray parlor, and my stomach churned uncomfortably. Dad? The boy asked, pausing the book and looking our way. His eyes didn't quite settle on us. He couldn't be much older than six. I imagined the panic he must have felt waking up blind one morning. We had all felt it, but as an adult, I had the twisted comfort of knowing that we were all in the same situation. It would have made less sense to a child. Adam sighed and seemed crestfallen. Hey, buddy, he answered quietly. Drew here. He's going to hold your hand, okay? The boy frowned, but nodded and reached out blindly. This is the first test, Adam explained. His eyes were sad, but hopeful, as if he expected me to work some sort of magic. I need you to hold his hands. I did as instructed, feeling the boy's small, soft hands in mine. Now what? Chuck says you have to will the color into them. I don't let him near him. I need you to will the sight into him first. Sight? Like, will him to see? It didn't work that way. I didn't think. The sight had come to me randomly. Or, at least it seemed like it. I'd woken up, and suddenly the world was a little more normal than the previous evening. I thought back to yesterday, and if I'd been jostled by anybody, or if a hand had lingered on mine for long enough to will the sight into me. There were always awkward encounters in a bustling city, full of groping crowds of blind people, but if someone had given me sight, I imagined they would have said something, or they would have been ready to recruit me the next day. Adam nodded. Please, just try. We think some people might be seers. They might be able to give sight. So I did as instructed, holding the boy's hands and willing him to see again. When I had exerted whatever effort it seemed appropriate to exert on such a futile task, I let go and turned back towards Adam. His eyes were damp, but he gave me a half-smile of appreciation. Thank you, he said, directing me towards the door to the room. I paused and turned around as I heard Adam helping his son to his feet. All right, buddy, time for bed now, he said to the boy. We'll see if you feel better in the morning. Part 3 I couldn't resist the urge to slip out of the base early the next morning to catch a glimpse of a sunrise over water. Security was surprisingly relaxed for a resistance movement, in spite of the weight that the words on the wall seemed to carry over everybody. The mystery of whatever entity had caused the blinding and had written the words seemed to result in indifference when it came to guarding the door. A watcher sitting at the door shrugged as I crept out the door. Be careful out there, he said sleepily. Careful of what? He shrugged and waved his hand vaguely. Them. If them was people, the guard was ill-suited to do anything. If there was something else, I shook my head in frustration and stepped out into the gray alleyway. At the far end, I could see people bustling by without even glancing down towards me. I had to remind myself they were blind. All of them were blind. I fell right into step with them, doing my best to avoid collisions without drawing attention to myself. Several times, somebody would stare right at me, and I would feel my heart flutter, but the looks were consistently empty and sightless. I found myself drawn to a riverbank, where I had spent many hours walking on lunch breaks, and before then, when I needed breaks from my studies... Benches lined the walkway that ran along the water's edge. Once there would have been lovers strolling along, hand in hand, or parents walking as their children skipped along in front, 
That would be hazardous now, given the water and the propensity of children to get themselves into dangerous situations. It was emptier now, but a few people still walked along, occasionally grasping for a stone and tossing it into the water. I smiled at the ripples that I could finally see again, and pitied those unseeing souls. They still said excuse me when they bumped into somebody. They still felt the warmth of the sun on their faces, but were blind to its brilliant splendor. I could see through the fog now, the gray haze unyielding. The same wretched words were scrawled on the benches in the walkway. Don't tell them you can see, repeated over and over again as I walked. I passed the occasional walker in the other direction, always making sure to stay away from the edge of the water. They ignored me, and I figured they just couldn't hear me. In the distance, a well-dressed woman approached, her pantsuit a dark shade of gray that contrasted sharply with her deftly pale skin. She wore sunglasses, an old-fashioned choice given the dim sun, and an even more bizarre choice considering she was blind. We were on a clear collision course, clear to me at least, and I shuffled to avoid her. She moved with me in an awkward dance, and her thin gray lips turned into a sneer. Why don't we have a chat? She asked, pointing a fingernail as black as her hair towards the nearest bench. I felt the bile rise in my throat as she smoothly removed her sunglasses, revealing brown eyes, almost dark enough to match the rest of her discolored being. She smiled at me cruelly, knowing she had caught me in some sort of trap, reserved for those who could see. I glanced around, and she shook her head. Maybe don't, she snarked, quashing any ideas I had of fleeing. I sighed and sat, looking out over the waves that lapped gently against the concrete side of the walkway. She sat with me in silence for a moment, and we watched a pair of gulls amble by. It's nice, isn't it? Her sunglasses were back on now. I nodded. It would be nicer in color, but I was glad to even be able to see. You're one of them, aren't you? The words marred the view, a constant reminder of this twisted reality, and I wondered what terrible fate would meet me now that they knew. Oh my. She responded with a chuckle and a shake of her head. No, not at all. I have no idea who they are. Then who are you? Why are we chatting? She glanced sideways, casting me a long, pensive look. Do you know what happens when they discover somebody can see? I shook my head. I knew people just disappeared sometimes, but that had always been the case, even before the blinding. She pursed her lips and nodded as if this proved her point. It's not good. I arched my eyebrows at her, prompting her to expand her explanation. They die, to keep it simple. How? You must have seen it. Somebody must have seen it. She seemed to know more than she was letting on and it made me doubt everything she had said so far. Something in the fog, she paused, looking out over the river to where the fog thickened so much that you couldn't see the other side. They disappear, just like the world did for all of us two years ago. One minute you can see them, the next you can't. She shook her head like she dreaded the thought, having seen it so many times already. Then she switched gears, launching a renewed assault on the little bit I thought I knew. You know that little group of yours? The Resistance, I think they call themselves? I kept a straight face and neither confirmed nor denied. She shrugged. She seemed to already know the answer. They're going to be the end of us. I gawked at her. That was absurd. I'd seen dozens of them colored and seeing, and they were perfectly fine. How? They just want things how they were. There was color. People could see. There's nothing wrong with wanting that back. She stared at me, and I could see my reflection in her sunglasses as we sized each other up. My hair was trimmed short since yesterday. After a couple of years of letting it grow long and unkempt, I had shaved in the evening too, removing two years of a tangled brown beard to reveal my boyish face. I didn't love the look without facial hair, but there was no salvaging the mess it had been. All the coloring? Trying to find a seer? If they succeed, we're all done. There'll be granting sight left and right, and once whoever this them thing is finds out we all can see, she scoffed. Well, that'll be the end. So what are you suggesting? Are you going to kill them? Are you going to kill me? She laughed again, that laugh that I found exceedingly unpleasant. It was as if she was mocking me, not just for my ignorance, but for the dreams I had of returning things to some resemblance of normality. No, that's not my job, she corrected, enunciating the my in an alarming way. I felt a chill run up my spine. We try to take a preventative approach instead of facing that ridiculously named resistance movement ahead on. A preventative approach? You kill people before they can see. That doesn't make you any different than whoever they are, I said, waving my hand around. It seemed to be the widely accepted gesture for referring to them. She sighed at me. Stop jumping to conclusions. What we know is a lot simpler than you think. We don't kill anybody. We don't have to kill. We just locate seers and... Kill them, I interrupted again, trying to finish her sentence. She shook her head and sighed again. Stop doing that. We don't kill them. 
We just prevent them from giving more people sight. We keep it under control. We make sure we don't get discovered. We make sure we won't get discovered. You're scared. It wasn't a question. It was a statement, as true as her skin was pale. Your fear makes you the enemy. You're keeping people from seeing. She looked at me curiously. She looked more human than she had up until now. I don't want to be blind again, she said simply after contemplating for a moment. You don't either. You wouldn't be here admiring this little bit of view otherwise, right? I sighed mournfully. She wasn't wrong. I had never quite grown accustomed to not seeing, like some others seemed to have. I missed the colors and the movement too much. I couldn't stand the idea of losing it all again. Right, I said finally. I don't want to be blind again either. Part 4 We were still sitting on the bench in silence as the sun reached its peak. The fog had given no solace, no little gap through which the sun could reach us unimpeded. I sat there, a reluctant and pensive prisoner, her, a mysterious captor, each ignorant of the other's thoughts. Finally, we both moved to speak simultaneously, and I laughed awkwardly as she ignored my interruption and spoke anyways. We could use your services, she said simply, not turning towards me. Your discretion would be encouraged, of course, but your position could help guarantee everybody's survival. I shook my head. I don't think you've been completely candid with me. I want answers. Then you'll get your answer. She considered my request for a moment before shrugging. I took it as an indication to continue. The words. Did you write them? I did not. She responded simply and without expanding. I glowered at her. Starting to understand the rules she was playing by. Do you know who wrote them? And who are you? I asked. Carissa, she responded. And yes, I do. I sighed and tenderly rubbed the bridge of my nose. Cursing her stubborn, taciturnity, she chuckled at my visible frustration and seemed to decide that she would humor me. There are people. All they do is write. Can they see? She shook her head, and I looked at her in surprise. No, she answered. Often it's people who aren't quite right. I suggest steering clear if you bump into them. How did they get into my apartment? The words had been everywhere. On the floor, on the ceiling, on the walls. They were on the streets and on the sidewalks and the walls. Whoever these writers were, they really wanted to make sure I saw their work. And if they'd been in my apartment, I hadn't noticed, or they'd come through when I was gone. Neither thought was particularly comforting. She cocked her head at me irritably, and then picked out a black fingernail, an apparent boredom. This is a lot of questions for me to get one answer. When I stayed silent, she sighed with exasperation. There are handlers who help them and direct them. She paused before deciding there was more to say. This, she said, pointing a finger first to me and then to herself, was not a coincidence. You have skills. She tapered off and reevaluated her words. Not skills like me or a seer or a colorer. You have connections in a position that happens to coincide with where we think the answers are. The firm? She nodded, and I felt vindicated by my suspicions that they had, in fact, been too prepared. This cult or organization had come to the same conclusion. We need you to keep going to work. Keep pretending you're blind, obviously. Don't draw attention to yourself, and we need you to keep interacting with the resistance. Tell them you're keeping an eye out for others. I don't care. Just do as you're told. Help us find answers and keep Sears away from the resistance, and we'll both be happier for it. Okay, I agreed standing. How will I find you? I reached out a hand to seal the deal. She ignored it, and I sheepishly slipped it back into my pocket. Same way you did this time. I'll be here. I glanced behind me as I walked away, and the fog had almost completely concealed her. She was still sitting at the bench, staring impassively over the river. Had I not seen her eyes, I would still be convinced she was blind. That was the point, I guess. Convincing whoever they were that she couldn't see. I liked the idea of a safer approach to recovering my sight and discovering the cause of the great blinding, but I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease at being part of the systematic suppression of sight in the meantime. She had also all but confirmed that they had a seer give me sight, so part of me felt I should be thankful for that. I weaved my way back through the crowd of laborers out getting lunch. It shocked me how little had changed. In spite of everyone being blind, and as for a good measure, the world going gray. Car still was by albeit driverless cars now, and stoplights still blinked, just slightly different shades of gray instead of red or green or yellow. Televisions and cafes and delis still ran the news, the background noise providing a sense of familiar comfort. At tables, people listened to books or podcasts or chatted with similarly dressed associates. The spontaneity, catching somebody's eye in a coffee shop or connecting over a book, 
seemed to have gone the way of their sight. In front of the office building where I worked, I paused. I resisted the urge to look upwards at the behemoth structure that eclipsed the sun even back when the fog didn't. Once familiar colleagues rushed by, their hair now overgrown, or their makeup disregarded. I felt a twinge of suspicion, too, wondering which of them might have known more about what it would happen than they were letting on. From the corner of my eye, I could see a dash of color in the alleyway where the resistance was headquartered, duck back into the doorway to continue their watch, where the resistance had yesterday seemed brave and selfless. It now struck me as foolish and short-sighted. Adam's voice beside me caught me by surprise, and I'd realized I'd been staring in fascination through a window to a television. Way to be subtle, he said with a grin, gripping my shoulder. I laughed it off, snapping my gaze away from the anchorman. His tie was impressively straight, and he stared fixedly at the camera, his eyes less empty than the eyes of the people around us. Sorry, I mumbled. I glanced around furatively, in case they had seen us. I turned back towards Adam. The sadness I had seen the previous night as he kissed his son goodnight was gone, replaced by the familiar cheeriness I had seen amongst the resistance members. How's your son? I asked. I immediately winced. Misery loves company, and his smile drooped now. Same old, he shrugged. I guess you weren't the answer to our prayers, he added with a chuckle. I laughed back humorlessly. I could have told you that. He misread my reaction for self-pity and gave me a pat on the back. Don't worry, Drew. We'll find a role for you yet. I shifted uncomfortably and avoided his gaze. I have to get to work, I said lamely, pointing up at the building as I changed the subject. He stared at me in confusion. For money, for food and rent, to live. I waved my hand around, encompassing everything around us as evidence. He must have thought I was joking. We supply everything you need. We have people who are, uh, acquire it. It was a bold-faced euphemism for theft. Everybody had heard reports of the increased looting since the Great Blinding. You're with the Resistance now. I brushed off his hand that was still on my shoulder. I'll be there after work, Adam, I said, and I slipped into the building. The lobby was bustling with people, and I maneuvered my way past them, and then badged through the turnstiles to reach the elevator. An attendant stood patiently inside, waiting by the buttons. I looked him up and down, and he smiled at me pleasantly. Which floor? Sixteen, I answered. Blind fingers reached deftly for the right button. I thanked the attendant as I got off. I was less than a quarter of the way up the building, quite some distance from the C-suite offices at the top, but some sort of outline of a plan was beginning to formulate. Sorry I'm late, I said meekly to my boss, peeking my head into his office. He was facing the wall and squeezing a stress ball. I think he did that more than he worked. He didn't care if I arrived at 8 or at noon, or if I didn't show up at all. No worries, Drew, he responded with a smile, pausing for a moment to turn his head my way. Then his attention was back to the stress ball. He had been squeezing it and bouncing it off the wall for two years now. I shook my head and made my way back to the elevators. 54, I told the attendant. He looked my way oddly and I felt obligated to explain why I was back. Boss wanted me to run something up, I explained. He smiled politely back, and the elevator started to move. I slipped a hand behind him and pressed another button. Thanks, I said as the elevator came to a stop on the 54th floor, and I stepped forwards. The door opened out to an office space, not much different than my own, and then slid to a close again. Then the elevator continued in its upward trajectory, and I could see the attendant shifting in confusion at the upwards movement. The elevator heralded our arrival to the topmost floor with the usual ding, and I slipped out before the attendant realized he hadn't been alone. Sorry, Sandra, he said apologetically to the receptionist. I must have pressed the wrong button. He seemed to doubt himself, but I stayed silent and he shrugged and the doors closed shut behind me. The top floor and everything on it was gray, as anywhere else, and I felt disappointed to have apparently not stumbled across some sort of eye-opening revelation. Maybe I expected a circle of colored executives plotting how to keep us all blind. There was nothing of the sort. Everything was gray except the receptionist, who stared straight ahead, unseeing, but basked in a full array of colors. At some point, she seemed to have been graced by a colorer, and not even realized it since no seer had stumbled upon her. Her eyes were adorned in a carefully applied mascara. I carefully stepped aside, out of what would have once been her line of sight. Her eyes didn't follow me, and I let out a silent sigh of relief. She sat still as a statue, hand clasped idly on her lap atop, a professional brown skirt. If it weren't for the occasional blink, I would have thought she was a mannequin. To the left, there was a black wall. I knew the building extended further that way, but there was no indication of a door, and asking the receptionist to allow me through didn't seem a viable option, so I went right, towards the glass-walled conference room, with a dozen chairs sat neatly around a wooden table, and the glass-walled office that would have once overlooked the city. Now the site was obscured by the fog. So thick, that one could not quite see the ground, and instead only the tallest other buildings peeked out over the fog below. 
Above the fog, the sky was blue. I stared speechless for a moment, admiring the simple beauty of it. Then I busied myself rifling through the contents of the desk, a task that proved fruitless and left me frustrated. There were client contracts on pages of notes, but nothing about the blinding. Back in the lobby of the top floor, the receptionist was still sitting perfectly still, seemingly oblivious to the presence pacing back and forth in front of her. There was a stairwell near the elevator, but the door was locked, and for a moment I thought she might have heard my clumsy attempt at opening the door. Pressing the button for the elevator would make a sound, then she would surely hear, and alarms would go off, and I would find myself escorted off the premises. Or worse, I glanced around nervously. She looked amused. I take it you didn't have a plan for leaving, she asked, and I felt my blood run cold, and the color drained from my face when I heard her voice. She was looking straight towards me now, her head pivoting mechanically as I stepped from side to side. I shook my head and backed towards the elevator and grasped backwards for the button. She stood robotically and I walked around the desk before stiffly turning towards me. Her eyes never deviated from staring straight ahead. The elevator dinged and the doors opened and I sensed a presence behind me. Something ominous and inhuman and definitely not an elevator attendant. The receptionist was close enough that I could see the teeny imperfections in her red lipstick and her trembling eyes as she forced herself not to look past me at whatever the elevator had brought up. What did the words say? She hissed. Don't tell them you can see, I responded. Reciting the phrase I must have seen several thousand times now, she chuckled darkly and nodded, her eyes still fixed on me. Well, now they know, she whispered and turned back towards her desk. Fog began to dissipate from the elevator, and little tendrils began to creep past me, snaking around my arms and legs. Part 5 A sense of peace came over me, just briefly. The colors flashed, the round blue logo of the company, the rainbow assortment inside the candy jar on the receptionist's desk, the geometric patterns of the carpet flooring. The fog was blue, and it was black, and it swirled and churned. Even where moments before, there had been no fog, then it went dark again. A darkness so black that even a hint of gray would have been comforting. I pulled against the sinewy tendrils wrapped around my arms and legs. I felt them tear and dissolve and momentarily release their hold just to wrap around me again. They tore my clothes and left long gashes down my arms that seeped black blood. The lights flashed and the world was gray now. Her brown skirt gray and my hands in the deathly parlor of the colorless and sightless masses outside and the logo and the candies back to a muted shade. Figures moved in my periphery, shadowy creatures of the fog, humanoid but diffusing as quickly as I could discern them into tentacles and reaching arms. There was color again. I could see the terror in her eyes and the agitated red luster of her cheeks as I clutched her blonde hair and pulled her back towards me desperately. The wisps of gray grasped furiously, hungering for something or someone. I saw them rip into her face, tearing at her eyes and ears as they took a hold of her arms and legs. Her blood was as black as mine. Everything went dark. Blackness. Oppressive and ominously familiar, but I faced it with renewed resolve. It was different than the great blinding, when the shock was overwhelming, and I had staggered into the street to see if anybody else's sight had been cruelly torn from them. Then, people had confirmed, numbly, indifferently. Something had compelled them to stumble their way to work, and continue as if nothing was amiss. They had told me it was for the best. They had told me it was necessary. My blind quest for answers had predictably led me nowhere, in spite of being fueled by anger and confusion. Search results were curated and censored, and the answers were unsatisfactory and concocted, intended to assuage people's fear and keep them from prying any further. Eventually, I just went about my quotidian routine, internally incensed, but externally Acquiescent and subservient, like we were supposed to be, like most everybody else was, robotically performing their expected duties, like lifeless slaves to some invisible master. This time would be different. I had seen again. I had seen what they had done to the world, but I had also seen that there could still be color. I had connected with the resistance, and I had connected with Carissa, and I knew that there were people out there who could restore my sight. I had hope now, and I knew that something could be done. Unlike when the blinding occurred and a hope eventually gave way to helpless resignation, my arms were free, released from the frog's freightful grip. I groped blindly, 
my hand settling on a motionless body. Don't touch me, please, a voice said quietly, meekly. It was the receptionist, as alive as me. I was surprised but relieved, grateful that pulling her into the fog in my place hadn't killed her, but fully expecting her to be gone. She was, in a sense, at least to my eyes. The flat apathy of her voice was the same I had heard in co-workers and family members and strangers when the fog first rendered us blind and thereafter. Gone was her amusement, as she cornered me and toyed with my desperation at the end of my impulsive exploration. Gone was the fascinated tremor of her voice as she ruthlessly sacrificed me to the fog. My fingers lingered on the steely cool of her leg for a moment before I moved them away. Sorry, I mumbled awkwardly. I was apologizing for touching her. I was apologizing for pulling her into the fog and allowing it to violate her how it had. If it was anything similar to what it had done to me, she deserved an apology. I was apologizing for being blind, unable to quite know where my hands would land again. I heard her sigh and stand and straighten her skirt. Security will be here shortly, she reported simply. I heard her pace back to her desk, the footsteps muted by the carpet. I felt rough under my hands. I tenderly rubbed my arm where the tendrils had gripped. There was no indication that anything had ever been there. Not a scratch or a blemish I could feel. My clothes were intact and untorn. I punched the floor in rage. I hated being blind again. I hated that the fog had managed to wrest away from me that iota of a triumph and good fortune that regretting my vision had been. I hated that Carissa had lied to me, telling me that the fog would kill when I had heard and felt both our bodies laying there after the fog had done its work. I hated that I would have to go crawling back to the walkway by the riverbank, groping blindly to find the right bench, and then hope that the deceitful woman would pity me enough to have a seer grant me back my sight. It was like a nightmare, where I ran and I ran, but my feet didn't move, and my inevitable demise just came closer and closer. I barely cared that the security would be there to escort me out of the building. I could manage. I was fairly certain. Between the support of the resistance and, well, that was it. Carissa was unlikely to think I had anything to offer now, that I was no longer employed at the firm, and I would be fortunate to convince her that I deserved to have my sight back. Can you see? I asked the receptionist as I gathered my wits and stood shakily. I was convinced she could see before. Maybe I had been a little bit louder than intended as I snooped through the office and around her desk. But the way she came at me and did everything possible to avoid a glance at the terrifying fog, preparing to attack convinced me she could see. She had just gone about hiding it in that stiff, robotic manner. Everybody who could see seemed to have their own way of hiding it, refined by practice, but still an awkward mimicry of how the actual blind acted. No, she answered, her voice demure and resigned. So that was that. I resolved to convince Carissa to have a seer restore my vision, be it with words or in some less savory manner. She had the seers that the resistance couldn't find. She had planted this little seed in my mind. She hadn't asked me to come snooping through the top levels of the building, but I couldn't help but blame her for confirming my suspicions and giving me a little trickle of information and half-truths. I was convinced she knew more than she was letting on. Are you okay? Your face... The fog. There was blood. My voice tapered off, reluctant to relive the carnage that the fog had ravaged upon her face. I'm fine, she answered resolutely. I don't know what you're talking about. Her voice was more confident now. I didn't doubt that she had no recollection of what had happened. I had seen my own arms torn and punctured by the tendrils of the fog, but now felt no pain and had no physical mark indicating that the damage had been done. The elevator dinged and an attendant greeted the receptionist warmly, as if the fog hadn't just assaulted and maimed us both all over again. He must have traveled up with it, ignorant to his presence as it quietly lingered all around him. I wondered if it was still around us now, lurking hungrily, or curling around my arms ready to seize me again at a moment's notice. He had other people with him now. I could tell by the bustle of footsteps and clothes rustling against clothes. Hands confidently grabbed each of my arms the grips more tangible than the grip of the fog, but still far less terrifying. There was comfort in what was known. The hands didn't grasp and reach like tendrils of fog or hands of blind people. I let them pull me towards the elevator and paused before stepping on. The guards acquiesced, 
Allowing me a brief moment, out of habit, I turned my head back towards the receptionist. I couldn't see her, but I knew she was there by the sound of her fingers, deftly typing away. Doesn't it bother you? I gestured with my head, in spite of neither of us being able to see. That they've taken away your sight? One of the guards pulled at my arm again, beckoning me onwards. I had asked so many people the same question in the early days of the Great Blinding. I always got the same answer. It never seemed to bother them. At least not nearly as much as it bothered me. You'll get used to it, she finally responded, ominously, as I stepped on and I heard the doors begin to close. I had heard the answer a thousand times before. I never did quite get used to it, and I could never quite comprehend how other people did. The attendant rode down in silence. I wondered if he enjoyed the rides with company more than the ones without. Surely this ride in particular couldn't be enjoyable, unless it was routine. The thought had crossed my mind that perhaps people like me, those who had unintentionally regained their sight, were gently encouraged to divulge their secret. That way, it would seem natural once their sight was taken away again. As natural as a manipulative, blinding fog could be. Maybe they attended and joined the countless indistinguishable voices, carelessly discussing business and personal matters alike. Maybe he enjoyed the silence. The whir of the elevator and mechanics, gradually growing louder as the apparatus accelerated and the eventual ding to indicate that the trip was over. Maybe he enjoyed life this way, invisibly going about his routine, indifferent to the ulterior motives of his passengers. It had to be easier to just press buttons and ride up and down than to start asking questions and be escorted out of the building. The grip on my arms loosened, and the guards chatted idly between themselves as we skipped every floor on the way down. Finally, one of them let go of my arm. I waited a moment to ensure he wasn't just scratching or adjusting his grip, and then I blindly lifted it towards where I knew the button panel was, taking care not to betray my movement by stepping in that direction. My arm was pulled aggressively downwards again, and the guard regained his grip. We fell into an uncomfortable silence, not willing to acknowledge the preemptive and inexplicable reaction to what they shouldn't have been able to see. If you like that story, please check out r slash Writes. And if you would like to hear me read more stories, please make suggestions in the comments down below. Thank you.